know, people, this is an exclusive gathering of only the brethren that are committed to the technologies of the dome. We don't let everyone in here, you know. Um, I'm Mark O'Neill, I'm the lead curator of the Seven Sisters Tracking uh, no, Songlines, Tracking the Seven Sisters, Minipuru Kunkaralkapa. See, there's Kunkaralkapa up there, and that's Seven Sisters in, one, in the languages around the APY lands. I'm just going to um, say, um, I gather you've all been at least six times and listened to the audio tour and sat under the dome at least for half a day, otherwise you wouldn't have been allowed in. Um, now, Peter Morse, we've been working with Peter, we're so grateful to have sort of come upon um, Dr. Sarah Kenderdine and Peter Morse and a little troop of people who helped put that whole dome thing together and Peter's been tediously involved with getting it every inch, he's, he's a perfectionist. Um, I might say anal, but I wouldn't say that. Um, he's very perfectionist and an amazing job for those who have seen it. And uh, we were so fortunate. I'm going to just now say I'd like to uh, acknowledge the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples on whose um, country we are standing today and hand you over to Penny, who will introduce Peter much better than I did. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the National Museum of Australia. My name's Penny. I have the great privilege of working here in our public programs team and being able to put these sorts of lecture series together. Um, it is also my great privilege today to introduce Dr Peter Morse, who has probably one of the best uh, job titles that I've ever heard, Full Dome Artist. Uh, so if you could please put your hands together and welcome Dr Peter Morse to the stage. Terrific. Thank you very much and uh, thanks for coming along today. I was uh, certainly upstaged earlier on by my daughter, who I think you know, hopefully will not outshine my presentation here. So I've got a lot of slides, so I'll try and move through them with great rapidity because it was a question of trying to discern how to pitch this talk, how technical I should be about things. Um, I'll cover a bit of uh, my background working in the medium of full dome, which you will now be familiar with because you've sat under a full dome in the exhibition. I'll talk a bit about uh, Dome Lab, which was a project initiated by uh, Professor Sarah Kenderdine, uh, formerly of UNSW and now at EPFL in Lausanne in Switzerland. And I'll cover a, a few examples of different dome works. I mean, some of you might think that full dome is a, is a relatively new medium. It's actually been going on for quite a few decades now, obviously since the advent of, you know, planetaria which date back to the 19th century and, and earlier but digital full dome is really something that's emerged over the last decade or you know sort of 15 years that kind of thing uh, I'll give a brief technical overview of uh, how full dome works and touch upon what we call computational photography uh, which is where we don't think of photographs really as images anymore, you know, straight from a camera. You manipulate them with computers in all sorts of different ways. And then I'll uh, try and cover as much as I can of the cave experience and the art experience dome projects. So the dome, dome lab is, is what's known as a, is a, a, it's a six meter Zen dome. Zen dome is a German company. It's a negative pressure geodesic dome. And this is a super high speed time lapse of it being set up. So there's an external sort of frame structure, geodesic frame structure, and then the internal uh, fabric is put on it and it's wound up. It's a very heavy thing. It fits in uh, one shipping container. It takes about a day to set up. There are eight projectors in there and it does true 4K resolution, which means that it's 4,096 pixels across in, in either direction and about 10,000 uh, pixels in the, around the circumference. Uh, and this was funded by this uh, ARC, Australian Research Council uh, infrastructure grant by Sarah Kenderdine. <coughs> so it's a super high resolution system, much higher resolution than 4K TVs, for instance. Now I developed uh, with Sarah and some other people a, a kind of animated interface for navigating through different types of content on the dome. So you'd see this projected over your head at the Michael Crouch Innovation Centre and it would zoom into uh, 
full dome video content and the premise behind this is that you would be able to navigate through different sorts of spaces um, and provide a sort of interesting you know user experience for, for for interacting with the dome so it's not just a passive uh, movie watching experience. This is an e example of, of a couple of works. This is by Sarah Kenderdine looking at ceilings, architectural ceilings in India. Now, uh, here's a, a few sort of uh, computer renderings of the dome lab installed in different places. The dome is capable of being a horizontal dome but also angled to about 45 degrees so you can change the way in which audiences uh, view the dome and the content in the dome. And uh, the orientation of the dome has a profound sort of impact upon how you experience content in different ways. And at the top we've got the, the human connectome model. Below that some imagery from Antarctica that I shot about 10 years ago. And to the right an image of it installed in the, I think, Prince of Wales Museum in India. This was a previs uh, before it went off touring to India. So that's another important thing of aspect of the dome is that it's, a, it's an experimental dome and it's a, a, a traveling system so it can be packed up and tour around the country and go overseas um, and provide content and experiences to people in a wide variety of different places. So it's highly adaptable. These are pre-visualizations I did of the dome installed in the NMA gallery when this uh, uh, project was first getting up uh, to get an idea of where it would be situated and its scale in relation to the rest of the gallery space. It's a very large structure, as you can appreciate, so you need lots of ceiling space and room around it. So there's quite a lot of logistical uh, overview that needs to be taken into account when it's being, uh, when you're planning to uh, install it and, and show content for it. So as I mentioned, I've been working in full dome content for over 10 years now. This is uh, a movie that I shot in Antarctica uh, in 2007 actually, so exactly 10 years ago. Uh, and this was uh, at the time super high resolution sort of content and this is work that I've done with the Mawson's Huts Foundation sailing over the seas to Antarctica, taking lots of cameras with me and documenting the Mawson's Huts heritage site. Oh, this is about a, a, a seven minute movie uh, that I can't play all these movies to you unfortunately but it'll give you an idea of the range of content that we can generate for these dome systems. Um, so with this you really feel like you're visiting Antarctica and huts and, and so on. Other content that we can generate for this is another work that I did in 2009 which is generated from global ocean data. What we've done here is use satellite data from what's known as the, the GEBCO data set, the, the general bathymetric chart of the oceans. Normally you see this with the earth underneath it. So what we've done here, I was working with a colleague of mine, Paul Burke, who I've worked with for many years um, in visualization and we extracted or sub subtracted the earth from this uh, GEBCO data set and we end up with the global ocean. So this enables us to appreciate that the ocean is in fact one ocean around the world. It's uh, all these notions of the Atlantic and, and the, the Pacific and so on are, are sort of, you know, ge they're human fictions really. And this dome system enables us to see this in, in an interesting new way. Earlier work that I'd done also uh, concerning uh, Aboriginal out, astronomy. Camp out under the I'll, I'll let you listen to this. The wind the lovely breeze blow through the trees and it blows around you. You hear the old ancestors whispering to you, telling you stories. And then at night you'd look up in the sky, he'd show us, even Dad used to show us. You see a shape of an emu. And when, he's, when it's just about coming close to laying eggs, the emu head be sticking up and he'd be feeding. You sit on your own and you look at certain things like, you know, and a story comes to you. And when you go to sleep, you'll hear the old people whispering to you, telling you about that story, about that thing which you see. So that was a movie that I made uh, for a group, an Aboriginal community in Carnarvon in Western Australia in 2012, and that was installed in a, in a museum there running on a 
a sort of permanent loop in a, in a cultural sort of visiting centre. And that was really the first work that I did, uh, becoming aware of the nature of Aboriginal astronomy and, and working with, with groups there and so on, um, and getting into photographing rock art sites. So this is a, 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 an early panorama that I did of, of Mandu Mandu Cave, which, interestingly enough, my sister, who's an archaeologist, uh, discovered a 30,000-year-old a, a 30, uh, um, uh, shell bead necklace in there, sort of one of the oldest shell bead necklaces from the Pleistocene area in Western Australia. So there's, you know, a bit of a family connection there with <laughs> looking at this, this sort of historical material. Other work that I've worked on is a full dome movie with uh, looking at um, astrophysical visualisation, working with astrophysicists where uh, Paul Burke worked on visualizations, computational visualizations of dark Have matter. You ever been lost in the and we worked with Alan Duffy, the astrophysicist, to create the, the oh, Fuldo movie Roshni Dark, which uh, plays in hundreds of planetaria ah, around the world. It's been playing for years now in 15 different languages in all the different Gold countries that you see there. So that's something that I would hope that will happen with the full dome movies that you've seen here in the exhibition, that it's, uh, these are full super high resolution planetaria movies that can play in planetaria around the world. So you can reach hundreds of thousands of people, which is an interesting proposition. You can hear Alan speaking here in Teglu. Well, I think in French, no. Okay. Now, besides working with Full Dome, I became very interested in revisiting materials, all the photographic material that I'd uh, created, and, and working in the area of photogrammetry. And this is where we look at talk about computational photography. Photogrammetry is a way of looking or taking thousands of photographs and processing, processing them by a computer using special algorithms called SFM algorithms, structure from motion, and you can generate 3D geometry. So the photographs are not just 2D flat photo images anymore, but they enable you to create 3D scenes in which you can then put virtual cameras and fly around. So for instance, I've got, this is a movie that I'm working on currently, revisiting material that I shot in Antarctica, where I can fly around Wilson's huts uh, three-dimensionally with virtual cameras and zoom in on details and reconstruct um, artifacts uh, from the environment. So it's a, it's, it's, a, you know, so it's a way of revisiting material that you may have shot years ago and discovering new types of content and ways of using that. So let's talk about Full Dome, how that works uh, in, in relation to the human vision system. The, the, the dome is a hemisphere, as you're aware. It's uh, 180 degrees by 180 degrees across, 360 degrees uh, around the circumference. Human field of vision, as indicated there, 220 horizontally, approximately 150 degrees vertically. So it's larger to, uh, vertically than your horizontal sort of field of view. So it's designed to completely immerse you so you can look around in the dome and it provides that sensation of uh, being in places and it can also provide strong feelings of motion sickness if things move too rapidly. So there's a, a, you've got to compensate with these sort of perceptual characteristics of the human vision system, the vestibular system, all this sort of stuff to make sure that your audiences don't feel ill or fall over. So that means that you tend to make content that's more stately and it moves in a slower sort of way and this creates complexities for things where people say well I want to suddenly zoom into this part or zoom out of that part of an image and so on. So there, there are all these characteristics that you sort of learn about through experience of working with the medium. The, as I mentioned, the full dome uh, really derives from planetarium systems, so it was based in astronomy, looking up at the night sky, which is so it's perfect for that. But when you apply it to looking at other types of content, you've got what I think of as the horizon content, or the horizon problem, sorry, which is if you imagine that you're looking straight up at something and you're doing it in a, in a naturalistic sort of way, where you're matching one to one between the dome and the environment that you're looking at, then your horizon is going to s sit exactly on the spring line of the dome. So we compensate for that by either disregarding naturalism and saying, well, let's tilt cameras such that the horizon appears across the dome in some way, or we can shoot with cameras with very wide fisheye lenses, so more than 180 degrees, like 220 degree lenses, or up to 250 degree lenses, which actually see behind themselves, and that's a way of 
bringing the horizon content into the dome. Uh, you can synthesize lenses through software, all this sort of stuff. And of course, you can then tilt domes too. So that's another way of compensating for, for this sort of horizon issue and how to get all this content uh, available to the viewer. To understand the, uh, the fisheye view, it's a bit confusing initially when you start working in it as a medium. You have a fisheye lens, which is this one 180 degree uh, lens. And when you take a photograph like this, you, you don't think, well, what's in the center of the photograph is right before the viewer's eyes. What's before the viewer's eyes, generally, if they're lying down with their feet towards the bottom of the image here, is actually at the bottom of the image there. And what's at the center of the image there is right above their head at the center of the dome, if it's, if it's a horizontal dome. If it's an angled dome, it will be more towards their field of view. So that you've got to sort of get your head around how you think about uh, working with images and that has you know, implications for panning movements across scenes or how you might zoom into something. You, you technically, in a sense, you, you can't really zoom in on domes. There's, uh, you can move cameras back and forward, but if you zoom, you change from 180 degrees to more constrained angles, which are not technically correct in relation to dome uh, projection. So we end up working in a spherical kind of space. You're all familiar with Mercator's map of the world. This is one solution for uh, unwrapping a sphere. How do you make something spherical into a rectilinear sort of image to work with? Or how do you get rectilinear images to map onto spheres? These are you know, quite complex mathematical problems. And they're solved through uh, 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 projection processes in geometry. So with a dome, what you have with a full sphere, uh, for instance, or rather not with a dome, with a full sphere, you have a, a Mercatorian or, a, or equirectangular image like this. You can see the image appears to be distorted at the top and appears to be distorted at the bottom. It's not really distortion. It's just projection. That's how the, how the pixels would unwrap in this sort of space. Uh, with a dome, you basically have the top half of that image there or the bottom half of the image, depending upon what you're looking at. You only capture half, half the sphere. When we uh, work with uh, dome systems, we start off with what are known as full, uh, full dome masters, 4K images as PNG Im sequences. So these, these are image files, and you end up with thousands and thousands of those because you're playing at 30 frames a second, and these days increasingly at 60 frames a second. So that gives you an enormous data rate with these images. We're looking at 10 minutes is about 200 gigabytes of data. Um, 200 gigs used to be a prodigious amount. Of course, these days you just can buy it you know, at the local post office. 200 gig drive is not terribly expensive. But the key thing is it's a lot, a lot of data to transfer around between software and over networks and all this sort of stuff. Storage is getting more amenable. Then you take your dome masters, which are these single thousands of single images. And for the dome lab system, we have to chop that up into eight image streams at this WQXGA resolution, or 2560 by 1600 resolution. And that amplifies the amount of data again. So you get 10 minutes is suddenly turned into 350 gigabytes of data. And what we end up with is these eight different sorts of eight videos chopped up and projected through the eight projectors, and then they're, they're tiled together or blended together more accurately on the dome. So you get this seamless, super high resolution image projected on the hemisphere uh, in front of you. And of course, my job is to make this all appear invisible to you. We need lots and lots of compute resources to work with this. So we have things called render farms, which is basically you have lots of network computers together, many terabytes of storage space. You need fast computers. You really need super high speed networking to transfer all this data around. It's, it really takes a lot of effort to, to, to work in, in this as a medium. It's very different to uh, conventional film production or video production. Uh, audio is done in a 5.1 standard at these uh, various uh, settings and so on to create a surround sound environment. Now when you've got shot all your material or you've got your animation content and so on, you want to bring this together. 
And this is where it gets kind of tricky because most editing packages are, are made to work in a rectilinear space with an XY coordinate system. But we're working in a spherical sort of space, which is quite different and quite challenging. It's only really in the last few years since the advent of the, you know, the commercial advent of 360 degree video and VR becoming more popular that software packages have become capable of working with um, spherically mapped content. And, and that means that you know, how the images map in the space and how you can do dissolves and special effects and lighting tricks, all this sort of stuff, is becoming gradually easier, but it's still not easy by any means. So let's move on now to uh, Wallaninga. Let's check how I'm going for time. Good, looks okay. Um, Cave Hill where we were tasked, me, when I say we, it was uh, Paul Burke came along, there was a whole team of people, uh, Margot and Christiana, who were in the audience today, were there organizing that, an uh, amazing effort to get all the people out there, um, and all the gear, because you, you travel with an enormous amount of, of, of equipment. Um, I was with my colleague Chris Henderson, who I've worked with for a number of years, uh, doing uh, full dome time-lapse uh, stuff, astro astrophotography specifically. And we flew from uh, Tassie to uh, eventually to get to Alice Springs and then out to Cave Hill, which is, uh, as indicated here, right in the middle of nowhere, which is, as somebody who's enjoyed working in Antarctica, the kind of place I like to work. It's wonderful working in these remote areas. So this is a bit uh, of, of scenery from where we were. You can see in the bottom left there a lot of gear, driving a long way, setting up tents, and then carrying heavy sort of camera gear and time-lapse equipment um, across these sort of fairly rugged kind of landscapes. And Chris and I had to separate ourselves from the rest of the crews out there because we're shooting astrophotography, so any illumination is going to destroy the material that you shoot. Fortunately, there's not much occupation out there and, and street lights and cars and all this sort of stuff, so we managed to get some really nice material shot. Um, I was up at uh, dawn and dusk shooting content on my trusty uh, 5D Mark IV camera. This is a 30 megapixel camera with a fisheye lens and it's with time lapse, the, you can't rush this sort of stuff. It takes time. It's documentary. You've got to you just be out there and what you get is what you get. You hope the weather's going to be good, that you're not attacked by wild animals or things like that occurring and that you have your batteries last and there's a million different parameters to worry about uh, in these beautiful romant land, romant, ro remote landscapes. And of course you can't rush back to go and get bits which you forgot to take with you, so you've got to be very prepared. So we uh, generated a lot of uh, astro photographic time lapse sequences. Um, there's a few technical details on the left hand side there. You're looking to say 2,000 to 6,000 frames uh, over a night, this sort of thing, depending upon the exposure times that you're taking these images at. And if you look at the two left uh, hand circles there, the same sequence but just processed differently. A big part of the, the process that you go through is post processing these images and making them into smooth, uh, seamless uh, movie sequences. We use a, a whole range of different steps, custom software, custom workflows and so on to get this into suitable for full dome projection. The other thing that, uh, or another important part of the assets for these movies were uh, panoramas. So we take, these are equirectangular panoramas, so these are either shot with multiple fisheye shots or lots of rectilinear shots stitched together to form full 360 degrees. So, and each one is about 12,000 by 6,000 pixels, so they're about 72 megapixel shots, so super high resolution. Everything has to be super duper high resolution for a 4K dome system, so there's just no way of working with low resolution material. Paul was flying a drone around as well, shooting the landscape and stitching all those images together, and then the sky that you see above Cave Hill there on the top right hand side is a synthetic sky put in. Uh, because you can't, otherwise you'd have uh, rotor blades of the, of the um, drone in showing in the dome. So these things are, are, in a sense, they look naturalistic and, and immersive, but they're kind of synthetic as well, computer-driven content. The other thing that Paul worked on were these um, jumpy figures, which you will have seen in the exhibition, which are these large spinifex grass and wool uh, sculptures, beautiful things. 
that Paul photographed and constructed these uh, 3D models. You can see on the top right hand there, there's a, that's an that's a example of, of a photogrammetric model. So it's a, uh, something that exists only in the computer. It has the texture applied to it, so it looks kind of realistic, but it's this sort of gray computer mesh that we then put in, uh, we worked with uh, um, uh, an animation company called Zero One, Brad May, to articulate and animate these characters, and that in itself is a whole saga <laughs> of complexity. With the photogrammetry, um, what we have here to reconstruct the cave, I'm talking about the, 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 the first Cave Hill movie now, is uh, hundreds and hundreds of photographs. If you look at the top right hand side, the blue stuff you see there indicates a camera point of view. And so we have 788 cameras taking photographs and generating 2.7 or 2.8 million points of data. And then when that's all constructed together into the photogrammetric model, we, uh, we have about uh, 10 million faces and 5 million vertices. So these are enormous computer models with enormous amounts of data, and you need really fast computers to sift through them and make sure that they're accurate and that the, the textures are looking good and things are not out of focus and all this sort of stuff. It's, again, this is why you need to be extremely finicky and particular about it looking okay because anything that you show on the dome, if it's got a flaw in it, it will just be stand out like a sore thumb. So you have to be uh, very particular about it. Now, then this is just the making a photogrammetric model. We then take that into a 3D visualization package. Here I'm working with Cinema 4D. Uh, 3D visualization package is a 3D animation piece of software. You can take a model in, then you can put virtual cameras in there and animate where they move around like they would in the real world. And you put a bunch of other stuff in there. If you look at the, the two uh, large rectangular black bits, for instance, are floating black bits of fog, which I stuck down the back of the cave because the photogrammetric model didn't completely cover the cave. And so if I shone, put a sun in this world, you'd have shafts of light shining through, which is not like the real cave at all. So we sort of basically, it's a bit of stage management uh, to construct a cave-like scene. And then we render this out with the virtual fisheye lens. So uh, my world, you, you can see me having a nervous breakdown here where I've got a whole bunch of people that there's a lot of kind of, you know, politics and people management and upward management and sideways management, this sort of thing going on. Uh, where we've got the traditional owners, there's an issue, they've, it's their story that we're telling, we have to be respectful towards that, an issue of cultural sensitivity, the real world, the NMA, a concern about archaeological accuracy and so on, and maintaining good relations with the, with the TOs. Sarah, the head honcho of the, of the dome project, a lot of, uh, you know, I suppose these arrows might indicate, you know, it's all your fault if it's not looking good. So small arrows indicate things which are less stressful for me. Um, and it's a, there's a whole lot of things going on there to get you, give you an idea. So now we've got uh, the, the Cave Hill movie, um, and we can, I'll just quickly run through the different scenes in this movie here. We start off with, uh, and so they're the, the circles that you see on, on the right hand side of the screen there. We start off with what's known as a little planet shot. And this is something that I actually wanted to do in a full dome show for years, where we start off with, a, a, it's kind of an inverse fisheye. If you look at what's happening here, we're flying down towards Cave Hill, but then it mysteriously averts and changes perspective and using a process of mathematical remapping, we're changing the perspective of an equirectangular image from looking up to looking down at the ground to looking up at the sky and then mapping that into a hemispherical dome environment. And that gives us a lovely transition from an overview to a ground-based view of the environment. And then composited into that is a time-lapse uh, Milky Way sequence that I shot. Uh, these time lapses obviously run all night, um, and it's the luck of the draw, depending on how they came out. But because of the, the wonderfully clear skies um, around Cave Hill, we got this absolutely magnificent shot of the Milky Way and Venus and the Moon, and then gratifyingly, Stanley Douglas uh, could talk to us about this in his in his native language. So we've got uh, Stanley's voice 
uh, mixed into the soundtrack here, just giving us the Aboriginal names of these particular celestial artefacts, which was great. Then um, we move into... Well, I'll just narrate the, um, the, the circles, actually, rather than... because uh, it'll, it'll take too long to play through the movie. This is one of Paul's um, panoramic shots of the external of Cave Hill. This is a shot with a drone, but processed here with a 230-degree virtual fisheye lens. So it's completely synthetic, the sun is fake, um, and the birds are fake as well. So it's a matter of, and then in this scene, for instance, we've got all these nice sparkly moats and sunbeams and all these things are synthetic. Uh, straight photographs can look a bit boring on the dome. You want to animate them and bring them alive a bit. So f one of my sort of aesthetic jobs was to, to put you know, little touches of animation here and there to bring them to life. Um, here, we're now inside the cave, we transition into the cave and we can do a kind of zoom here. This is strictly speaking not mapped correctly for the dome, but an interesting thing there is that the human sensorium is quite forgiving of these sorts of mappings in, in the dome, but you've got to be careful of exactly what you're doing. And then we move on to a series of um, stills, fisheye stills, but all these are heavily processed as well to elicit data. Um, it's quite a dark environment the cave. We shot in what's known as HDR, high dynamic range. So you do multiple exposures. So you're not just taking one photograph, but you might, for instance, in this shot, it could be five photographs which are composited together and then multiple layers of those HDR images are recomposited together to elicit fine detail um, showing on the cave walls. So it's all, you know, very complicated sort of stuff that looks deceptively simple, like a straightforward photograph. And then from this part here, all these, all these shots are also working very closely with uh, the NMA archaeologists saying there's this particular wall that we really want to look at, this is part of the story and so on. So this is constant um, toing and froing between the sort of material that I could produce and the material that they needed to have in the dome and also Sarah's uh, concerns about the, the overall aesthetic look of it. Here we're in a, this is the photogrammetric model now, so we can fly around the cave uh, with a virtual camera, with a virtual fisheye lens. The trees and bushes and sky that you see outside at the bottom are completely fake and computer generated, but from photographs that were taken at the site, so they look realistic. And again, the detail that you see on the cave surfaces here, this is all elicited by heavy sort of visual graphics processing to get that sort of detail out, but still maintain a sort of naturalistic sense to the whole thing. And here we see the image in the centre of Watiniru himself, um, now somewhat faded after being uh, touched many times, a lot of fingers apparently uh, eroding the, the paint surfaces and so on. What's exciting about this kind of stuff is that we can, uh, these create archive quality uh, recordings of environments which you know are exposed to to the elements so it's a wonderful way of, of revisiting sites and seeing how they change over time and they can be I think they're important sort of cultural assets for museums to be collecting um, in any historically significant site we move back now to still photographs with a gentle zoom in and some glowy sunbeams and moats and things like that and then, so I will end up narrating this whole movie for you. Um, a time-lapse sequence of an ancient hilly tree, I believe that's correct, um, that was nearby Cave Hill. Chris and I were camping away from other people, so we just wandered around the landscape and responded to it, you know, what was there, what was interesting to look at. Um, and then this was a shot I was particularly happy with because this is an experiment where I took two uh, opposing fisheye time-lapse cameras, 180 degrees each, and they're stitched together into a fully spherical 360-degree VR time-lapse image, um, moving through the desert to give you a sense of what the desert environment was like. It's sort of this beautiful garden-like place, but still harsh. And then we finally ascend into the heavens at the end. Now, the other part, or the other uh, movie that I was 
uh, was a, a major part of this, and this was uh, uh, Sarah's, I think, initial idea behind this was to look at these artworks, these paintings, and figure out a way of putting them onto the dome so you could really get intimate with these images and see what's going on in them and understanding the iconography behind them because they're, they're, they, to, to a, a, a naive viewer they seem very abstract but obviously within their communities of context they carry a lot of highly culturally specific yeah. information and their stories and their ways of understanding the world. So the dome is an interesting way of approaching that as a form of knowledge and, and translating it, I guess, for the viewer. Um, if you see that the funny white blobby thing is not, uh, uh, not terribly clear what it is there, is a sort of iconographic explanation provided to me by Christiana. So this is saying, this is this part of the painting, this is this, this signifies this, this is this rock hole, and so on. So um, that was an important part of the process to uh, get these things uh, as accurate as possible. Now, we have the interesting question here, how do you get a circular painting onto a dome? Because a circle is not a hemisphere, it's a different shape, it's kind of round but it's two-dimensional as opposed to three-dimensional. So there's an issue there. If you put a circle onto a dome, it gets all stretchy. You'd have to pull it down like a hat over your head or a disc over your head, and all these bits get smeared out. So I had the wonderful and nightmarish opportunity to look at how to reproject these sorts of images into a equirectangular projection. They were um, provided to me by the NMA very generously at this super duper ultra high resolution. So you're working with four gigabyte images. About one of them was uh, 36,500 uh, pixels square, which is just enormous. I mean, most software packages are not designed to work with images of this resolution, and graphics cards choke on them. And then I had to scale them up to equi rectangular mappings, and then downsample them and do all this stuff to them. And why do you need to do that? Well, you need to do that so you can then project it into a spherical space and put virtual cameras in there and move them around and they look okay. And so we can move from point to point with a narrative. Similarly, when we work with uh, square paintings, then we enter what I describe, of as, as describe as a world of pain, working with equi-rectangular projections. This is nightmarishly complicated stuff, um, not only because of the, the nature of the projection that you're working with, but the fact that you have to tessellate or tile the painting to extend it out into a spherical coordinate system seamlessly. You want to retain the integrity of the original image. You want to be able to move around that image. Um, there are all sorts of issues going on. And then uh, to make it even more exciting for me, uh, we need to animate that and put multiple layers on it with uh, indications and highlights of what's occurring in the painting as we move through the narrative. Um, this is an example. Uh, where we had uh, part of the story is what Nehru turns into a carpet python and it raises the interesting question what does a wooden carpet python look like when it flies? Well I have no idea and the animator had no idea so we sort of looked for carpet pythons on the internet that kind of thing movies, you don't see flying snakes terribly often when you work with computers in a room somewhere um, and so the, it, it was it was sort of working this out so it looks uh, reasonably good so that, that's and then of course you have to animate that uh, snake in in a spherical coordinate system and composite it over the top so these are extra layers of complexity that one is is working with matching it between what was provided to me by zero one and we were constantly on uh, sort of video conferencing or by email and so on to, to work this kind of stuff out. Another um, important thing was to highlight uh, elements of the iconography of the paintings as we moved through them. So I went through many different iterations of styles to do this. You could either have a kind of boring spotlight moving across something, or is it okay to change the color of the paintings? Uh, are there, these are all examples of various iterations that I went through working at you know, what would look best, because it's, it's not just a question of 
this looks okay, but it's a question of does it look okay in the dome as well, because one of the issues with the dome is a thing called cross bounds, where you've got multiple projectors projecting onto a hemispherical surface, and if you, if, for instance, if you're looking at something that's quite dark, but you've got something quite light behind you, all this light will bounce off behind you and wash out the scene in front of you. So there's, there's constant sort of management of, of lighting issues in the dome environment as well. And that's why I went through processes of adjusting the illumination of these images or the, the colour of them and so on to try and manage these sort of cross bounce effects and enable us to attend to particular parts of the scene. Um, and I think we resolved it fairly happily with the highlighted points and dropping the paintings back in, in levels of luminosity. So what we have here now, I'm talking about the, the art film. We start off with the jumpy figures. That in itself was an enormously complicated process with the, with the photogrammetric figures which are rigged which are what, with what are known as inverse kinematic structures or skeletons which enable you to animate them. Like, so you've got to put a little skeleton inside each figure which has arms and uh, you know, bones going up its arms and elbows and shoulders and joints and things like that. And so you can... Uh, make these characters move in particular ways and that was achieved also through uh, uh, motion control uh, work where uh, the Zero One team filmed a, a dancer who did a series of dances and then those videos were translated into motion control points and then mapped onto the figures so, that, so they move like human sort of figures so a, there was a whole background process occurring there. Then in the art movie, we cut to the scene where we're flying across Australia and visualising where all the song lines are. And this was provided to me as um, Google Maps data with a series of points showing specific song lines and, and, and points of, of particular relevance to these song lines that I would then map onto a high resolution image of Australia which was a digital elevation model that I created specially for this project with uh, data supplied to me by the Australian National University Viz Lab, a colleague of mine, Drew Whitehouse, and I'm very grateful for him providing me with this ultra high resolution data from the, for, uh, the Australian, uh, what are they called again, the, the, the Geophysical Survey of Australia. Um, and so this is a highly accurate model of Australia with uh, we can fly closer into than you see on the dome with uh, textured satellite data draped over the top so in the future I could imagine revisiting this and uh, the model and flying to along different song lines and looking at different places and then I had the interesting challenge there of matching that with uh, the the painting of the song lines from 1995 um, I've forgotten the, the, the painter's name um, that was o that was to be overlaid with this uh, accurate digital elevation model of Australia, and as you can imagine, a, a, a hand painted painting is not accurate like a computer or a satellite was is. So there was a lot of of gentle nudging to get these things uh, to work together and create the revolution of the song line stretching across the continent. Um, and I can see lots of interesting future possibilities for doing some some things with this for the dome including some, perhaps some real-time sort of content. Then uh, the bunch of other scenes that I'll cover here, we move through various paintings and we have Watiniru's eyeballs showing, you know, watching um, the sisters as they travel across the landscape. And then if you look at the, 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 the bottom left-hand side here, this is an interesting shot for me because this demonstrates where we reach the limits of resolution of the scans uh, that were provided to me on the dome. Even though they're super high res, because you're working with a super high res system, I couldn't actually get in closer than this to the paintings themselves without them starting to pixelate or break up and so uh, and we're talking about these massive massive scans here so there are a number of tricks involved there where we flew across the landscape and and, and this waterhole actually detaches from the painting and flies up towards the view and fades out and we transition into the final scene there with what he near the snake wrapping around the scene and a series of and then behind that the um the astro photographic time lapse 
uh, sequence that I shot at Cave Hill, and the sisters finally flying away into the sky, which again it was a challenging animation experience. And, I th and there was a lot of toing and froing between Sarah saying, I want them to be more flyy like this and off in this direction, and Brad, you know, seeing constrained by what he can do, and then the context of the dome, all this sort of stuff. So there, it, it's really a team effort, these kinds of shots, to, to pull them together. A lot of discussion um, involved, and then also coming back uh, and talking with the NMA uh, crew to see how they think this is going. So uh, I think we came up with a, with a happy uh, result. And Welcome then this is the final movie. And Galpa, a story of the Seven Sisters. The sisters are traveling At this point, we've got the, the narrative being Their spoken by Shelley Morris, which was recorded also, in a recording you, studio in Sydney. You can see here, um, here and then the this was mixed into the sound, the ambient soundscape by Cedric Maraday, who was a colleague of is a colleague of Sarah's, who I think did a wonderful job of bringing these movies uh, to life from west to east. Along their journey, the sisters create sacred sun. Okay, I won't let that play because you've probably seen this. And I think that's the conclusion of my talk. So uh, all the people I need to thank are there. Um, and I think that's pretty much covers it. Okay, so thank you very much. And if, if anyone has any questions, I have microphones here for you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating, and I'd be happy to sit and watch the movie again. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure everyone would. Um, I, I'm can, I can pop it on with no sound. Yeah, why I not? I do that. There we go. I'm curious about you know, you're talking about the sort of chain of command of you know, how this thing's being received, and when do the owners see it? Where are the owners? Yes. Well, and how involved were they, and how much the, bounce back had to go there? The, they were very involved. I mean, probably uh, Christiana can 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 uh, and Margot can talk about this in more detail. Um, they, we, uh, I, I met them uh, out there. There was a lot of discussion, obviously, and, and approval of, of the content. Um, as far as I'm as, uh, aware, we would work on stuff and go back to the NMA people who would go back to the traditional owners, and there was this constant communication there. And then the great thing that happened was that they came to the Dome Lab in Sydney and saw it in situ for the first time, and I think they were thrilled with, with the content. So we were very conscious of, of maintaining good you know, and clear relationships through that entire process. Yeah. Oh, uh, the APY lands, for example, um, it's not the traditional owners we're talking about consulting here. The, they have to conform to the, um, the, the APY Council has to conform to the Native Title Act and the Cultural and Heritage Act. So any activity whatsoever, whether it end up being a 10 minute thing like this or clearing a water hole or building the road has to go through <clears throat> consultation of every one of the APY community councils along the route, regardless of it being this. That's one level. The second level, because the song lines are all connected, even though Stanley and them are the traditional owners of Cave Hill, they can't speak for what, went, what sites are before and what sites are after. But those people who are custodians of the sites before and after need to know what's happening next. So that's, that's the kind of what we're talking about. So it's not consultation in the normal sense you'd understand it. So, I mean, these meetings that occurred repeatedly and would have all the problems, some turn up, some don't, not the right people, not enough, you know, and getting them all to certain sites. So <clears throat> it was all of that kind of stuff, and that's not to the point of looking at what's in the, not, that's not the consultation of looking in the dome and seeing whether that's what you want. For that part, that um, Peter's involved with, there, um, there were never any issues that we were particularly aware of except that um, it got stalled towards the end when people assumed it was for cultural reasons, but it wasn't. It was, um, <clears throat> and I just took the, I just bit 
bit the bullet and said we're going anyway now because I don't believe it's got anything to do with cultural reasons that what was holding it up and it wasn't, it was a cultural tourism operator who didn't like a big mob taking flash films because then it might impinge on his business that's what it was right so we just got him on a plane and went anyway and once you get there you sort it out so there's all of that but in terms of what D Peter did in that dome there are never any anything but joy and glee and great sense of privilege. Uh, if we, does anyone else have any questions? Yep, lovely. Thanks for a great presentation. Last, in the exhibition, it's talked about the fact that the song line just doesn't end in central Australia but goes right across to the east coast. In the future, is it possible to, to do more of this song line story across to the east coast and then hook it up to the original central west coast story? So, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I can. Uh, that's where I can see some of this stuff going. That's why I was referring to that with the Australian model and so on. And we're, we're, if you've got the data, we can really visualise anything that you want. Um, but the question there is obviously things like budget, budget and time and this sort of stuff. All this stuff is it, it's very labour intensive to do it. Um, but having said that, you can uh, have uh, real time systems using not not pre rendered movies. But you could approach it using computer game engines and using uh, databases of, of information. It would be lower resolution, but you could navigate through much more complex interactive environments, like a VR environment or something like that, or you could show it on the dome. And that would be a way of bringing more and more detail together. Because if you think about it, there's probably uh, you know, dozens or hundreds of hours of potential content about the song lines and contents, uh, contexts and things like that. So it would be, you know, how would one go about consolidating that all together? And I'd suggest that a, a, a kind of interactive model would be uh, an interesting way to approach that. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, Um, will this exhibition travel around Australia? I hope so. I think the museum people know more about this, so, so Margaret. It's actually going to travel for sure. First overseas, though. You're going to get appreciated in your own country when it's been overseas, you know that. The cultural cringe is alive and well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Prophet's not on his own land. Um, anyway, my, the, so yes. Resoundingly, yes. Um, you said seven, eight hundred and eighty-eight cameras. What what does that mean? What it means is seven hundred and eighty-eight photographs. So the software uh, refers to them as cameras, uh, but they're actually seven hundred and eighty-eight images. But it, re uh, it refers to them as cameras because it's calculating where a camera would be in that scene, and so therefore what the real thing is that a camera would see, rather than. Yeah, rather than thinking of it as a still. Yeah. yeah. The scans of that scan, they scan rather than... No, no, they just take photographs. They use algorithms using structure from motion or uh, algorithms, which means that I take one photograph with a particular view, I take another photograph of the same thing from a different perspective, and using computational processing, I can calculate what that thing in the real world, the shape of it is from these two photographs. So it's very sophisticated. Mm -hmm sort of stuff, yeah. That would have just been my question to how you figure out of those 790 photographs, um, how do you stitch them together that it, you actually get the form of the, the true form of the cave with mm -hmm. all its... Um, well, I'm fortunate. I, I, I don't do it. The software does it for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, some very clever people have clearly worked out, you know, mathematically how to do this. This is a, photogrammetry is something that's really been evolving probably the last 20 years, 15 years, something like that, until it became commercially viable. The other thing that's really crucial behind all this stuff is that computers were not fast enough to do this until about 10 years ago, and, and you know, th that you could do 
you know, photogrammetry that would complete processing within your lifetime. I remember looking at computers that would say, well, estimated rendering time for this one year, six months, and you know, this sort of thing. So nowadays we can do it within a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. And um, does it require a particular system in photographing the cave? to ensure that you actually don't have any holes or gaps? Yes. All these things require techniques of taking photographs. So it's really, f you, you, you could, in theory, hold a camera and just point it randomly around a place and hope that to produce a photogrammetric model from it. But you want about 50, 30 to 50% overlap between each image. Uh, it's really about this degree of overlap between the images that enables you to algorithmically reconstruct the geometry uh, behind it. Uh, and you've got to be aware of things like lighting, variation in lighting. This is why we look at things like using HDR, high dynamic range, such that you get good, exp uh, good compensation for overexposure and highlights. You get shadow detail, you get good mid-range detail, things like that. Because you've got to remember that computer algorithms are not intelligent. I mean, they can't make aesthetic or intellectual judgments like we do, they're just, it's purely based upon the data there. So that if the data is garbage, then you'll get garbage results from it. So, and that comes from experience working in these different contexts and so on, yeah. So in some ways, a super low range um, uh, use of that particular um, programming would be when you have a camera and you do a panoramic shot and you do the three photos and they, it kind of stitches them together? Uh, no, that's different. That's, uh, panoramas are, are not photogrammetric in nature. You could make a photogrammetric panorama. Uh, a, a, a panorama is, is really just a 2D photograph stitched together saying these bits of the image match. Let's blend them together to make a larger photograph. So that's what's occurring there. Yeah. This is not a question, it's just to say, I was exhausted listening to you, and I can't imagine what it must have been like. Well, it was exhausting for me too, I can tell you. <laughs> How long were you there? Um, well, for the, the trip was only about five days to, to, to Cave Hill, um, and then I, because I'd never been in that area before, I, I took another five days and drove around looking at Uluru and, and places like that, and there's so much wonderful stuff there. I was grueling with, you know, the sense of possibility, looking at the Henbury craters and, the, you know, all, all the stories, you know, that uh, relate to the landscape there. So I could imagine going back there and producing a lot more exciting new content for, about this sort of stuffing and looking at different ways of telling these sorts of stories. Uh, but the actual work itself, producing these two movies, is six months of full-time work of really long hours, working with lots and lots of computers and rendering and, you know, hundreds of emails and hundreds of phone calls and all this kind of thing. It really was a prodigious amount of work behind making these. And that's the funny irony of it, is that you end up with, you know, 15 minutes of movie at the end of it um, that people enjoy, but they don't really understand the suffering that went <laughs> in on, on behind it. But uh, that's, all, that's all part of the plan, I guess. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's a really good point uh, that Margot has made. If it wasn't, if he wasn't so good at it, it wouldn't look so easy. Um, can I just get everybody to put their hands together and say thank you very much to Dr. Peter Morse? Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.